Kia ora koutou, hello everybody and welcome to Epic Aotearoa Create a Better Future podcast with your hosts Joe Hortai and Brian Osman, who have the privilege to connect with and share the lived experiences of imperfect but inspiring people from all walks of life. We thank you for spending some time with us today and hope you find value in the messages shared. Join us in doing your bit to create a better future. As Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Let's create a good one. Let's go. Tēnā koutou katoa, nō mai, haere mai, and welcome to another exciting episode of Epic Aotearoa, Create a Better Future podcast, especially for two reasons. This is our 50th podcast, so thank you for all the guests that have come on, and that is number one, of course, and agree to share their stories, and of course, listen uh, to our listeners, and for those who have taken time to listen to these stories, and of course, number two, most importantly, yes, our guest today is someone that's achieved so much in the chosen sport, such as played 150 times for the second best team in Super Rugby, the Crusaders, behind the mighty Hurricanes, I must say, <laughs> yes. <All right>. And <laughs> along the way, <laughs> has won four Super Rugby championships. A six-time member of the IRB World Rugby Team of the Year, 2012 to 2017, a seven-times uh, Tri-Nations Rugby Championship winner. 11 times Bledisloe Cup winner, a two times Rugby World Cup champion back to back in third place in 2019. Played 128 rugby tests for New Zealand with 100 of those as a starter. Two times New Zealand Rugby Player of the Year, uh, 2010 and 2013, and IRB World Rugby Player of the Year in 2013. Has captained the All Blacks a mighty 52 times between 2013 and 2019. And most recently, in 2020, was awarded the ONZM Officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit Award. And amongst all that, a pretty handy cricketer as well. He has played alongside the legends of the game, and it's fair to say that he is one of them. Mm. He redefined the number eight position in rugby with his speed, physicality, and skill that complemented seamlessly with his mostly partners in crime, Jerome Kaino and Richie McCall. We saw him take the all-black captaincy and make it his own. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, and with great excitement from Joe and I, we'd like to welcome Mr. Kieran Reid to the show. Welcome, brother. Thank you for coming. No worries. Good to see you, boys. How are you? How was that for the introduction? Oh, man. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> taking me back to you. It's going to make it a bit shorter, I'm sure. <laughs> I was just going off Wikipedia and thought, oh, what? how do I fit this in? Must be messy, right? All right. Let's kick this off, and, and I really want to ask um, no, a man. question that would just, I hope, set the foundation for us going forward, because we really want to explore the leadership side of things and see how um, how that has worked and with you, particularly as, as you morphed into this part of your career going forward. Is The question is, uh, call why queer? Who is Karen Reid? Who are you? Yeah, look, I, I guess... Um... You know, first off, I'm Kieran Reid, the dad, you know, family man. I think that's nice. that's my identity. That's, um, you know, right now yeah. um, is what I take yeah. the most pleasure from. Um, you know, being in the spotlight and being in, you know, playing for your country and playing professional sport for a very long time and um, very hard to kind of switch off from that, you know, when, mm. you, when you're in that mode. And you, you probably know Joe a little bit, you know, how you come home and, yep, you're there, but maybe you're not fully present so um you know since i've retired um i've really embraced that yeah. side and, and really enjoyed it and i've always had time for my kids and, and enjoyed it but without the anything kind of lingering in the back of the mind and um thinking about that next game or the game that's just been um you know it's been awesome to be able to do that um help out kids <laughs> sport and, and different things so mm. um look you know i'm kind of someone who's yep really well settled down here in Christchurch. Um, I've got roots a little bit around a different country, you know, my dad's from Taranaki, my mum's family's from um, kind of South Canary, Timaru. Um, mm. So I've got family South Island and then I grew up in South Auckland and Papakura uh, and Karaka. So um, yeah, like I, I feel like I'm, yeah. you know, someone who's kind of, I guess, 
been around a bit in New Zealand, experienced a lot of things and, um, mm. you know, probably when you talk about that leadership side, like I absolutely loved as I grew into, um, you know, my own space, my own confidence throughout my rugby career. I was like, man, this is something I could do yeah. kind of post footy. So mm. um, it's quite cool exploring that um, and just seeing where that goes at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it sets me. Oh. I like that. Yeah, that is beautiful, man. No, that, that was that is so nice. Hear, it's nice to hear that you, yeah, sorry, you know, traverse pretty much up and down the country, and 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 you've you've gone to different places. I didn't hear you say you settled in Wellington at all, but we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll forgive that. Yeah. So it did, <laughs> it's a bit wet. A bit wet. Wellington is too wet. Good, and too wet. Too wet. And wet. <laughs> <laughs> so. I guess just to follow on with that, when you're saying that, and, and it really resonated with me that when you're talking about the transition, you know, from a um, somebody that's in the prominence of, of spotlight, you know, with rugby in New Zealand, the way it's held, and you know, and the, the 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 pedestal and a lot of players are, are, are had to. But I, I guess when we're going mm. back a little bit to you, and you talk about you know, you, you you grew into your leadership space, is it what is it that drives you? Because from what I can tell, and what probably a lot of us see is that you know, a, a, superb, a superb sports person, um, an, an academic, somebody that, that's well-versed, well-rounded, that's what it seems like. But what's the driver for you? What drives you? Yeah, look, I think in, the, in that leadership space, what drives me and, and probably what drove me uh, when I was playing as well was just, you know, helping people. You know, that's, mm. Basically, that's it. You know, it's like um, I actually get a you know, personally get a kick out of helping people. And I think that's, you know, it's great. And then also like seeing, um, you know, the difference you can make, I think is huge. And that's probably where I'm at now. And this second part of, of my life and, and career and doing this stuff, it's it's slightly different to, you know, helping people on the rugby field and, and mm. collectively get into thing. But, um, you know, I'm really hoping to have an impact on, you know, different organisations, you know, people... Mm. Um, businesses, you know, as you say, the, the corporate world and stuff, and trying to make, you know, it easier for people, make it, um, their lives better, um, and obviously, you know, improve themselves. So um, that's probably what's driving me now. And it's it's funny because I guess you, you know, the All Blacks and playing at, at an international level such a peak, and it's um, you could think that that's your yeah. purpose done in life but it's like man i'm 36 now it's like i've got a long time to go like, oh. um you know and people say oh you're yeah. retired and it's like man it's <laughs> funny because you can't you know, it's, it's, i reckon you can't, if you say to yourself you're retired and it's like man i've still got 30 years or whatever to or 20 30 years of you know a good life and where basically everyone yeah. else in the you know in society makes the majority of um, their career in this next next phase. So, um, but yeah, it's it's different. Um, but as you say, the perspectives I've I've gained and um, and for me to be able to try and pass those on and, and kind of my way, you know, um, that's that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Can I ask, Kieran, because I look at at the stuff that you've achieved over time, even through yeah, school, and yep, I guess. Yep. Um, through your upbringing and I think your mum was a teacher was that right yeah and and so I guess it could be easy myself included to mistake or maybe look at and think that things were just easy for Kieran and his family and think that uh, they had it easy that's why he had a, mm, a, a mm. path towards but people don't know and don't see the hard work that went in behind it the sacrifices that are made the effort that you put into things and and maybe even some of the challenges and I was just wondering would you be able to paint a bit of a picture for us in terms of your your journey coming through the you know growing up and in, in terms of your finding yep. your passion and interest in rugby because you were quite the handy cricket batsman too from what I read and understand, but you chose to to pursue more the rugby path and maybe would you mind yep. talking us through what some of that process was for you any challenges or any standouts in your mind that stick out and and continuing yeah, on to where look, you are think, now um, to, actually to get into you know, the all blacks I've, I've reflected a lot on that in the, in the last couple of years since i've um, finished and um you know I, we had a great childhood i had a great you know i'm the middle of three brothers and um you know basically 
you know, had everything we wanted um, and what we did. I, I think mum and dad lived pretty frugally though, you know, it was just how it was back in the day. Um, and we were kicked outside most of the time to go and play outside and we lived on a cul-de-sac in Tapakura. So it was, you know, kicking a ball around with the neighbours, you know, out there every day, you know, doing something. Um, and that, you know, I flourished in that environment because that's what I love doing, um, was being outside and, you know, playing cricket, rugby, you know, we had Roller blades, like the mighty duck will just come out. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're playing inline hockey on you know, the goals and cow. Mighty ducks, yeah. the, um, the cul de sac, and um, you know, it was just you know, for me that kind of um, you know probably shaped me a little, a, a lot really in terms of being able to just adapt to you know um, and enjoying the outside life. And mm. um, and my dad probably always as well. He probably really. He never pushed me into sport, but I played, you know, we played cricket, rugby, athletics, um, with our main sports plus everything else at school and stuff. Um, you know, and he'd just always say if, you know, yeah. I was getting a bit titchy or bored or something, I'd just go out, go out and hit a few balls or go out and do some passes. You know? <laughs> and his, it was just his way of saying, hey, if you want to, <laughs> you know, do this properly, then go and practice, you know. And, you know, it really stuck to me. So the whole work ethic thing I think I had was, you know, really developed quite early because um, I'm not sure. I think I was talented, um, yep. but I think the talent came through just repetition of doing stuff and being a part of it for a long time. Um, so, you know, I think probably one of the, if I look back at kind of my, um, when I went to high school, I went to Rosal College and then, mm. so in year nine, so third form, I went there and then, um, St. Kent's, so which was um, a school in Auckland, it's a big rugby school, it's a big kind of um, uh, yeah, private school in Auckland, and um, they offered a, a scholarship, a half scholarship for me to go, and kind of for my cricket, I think, and a bit of rugby. Um, and my parents were like, You should probably take this up, this is a great opportunity, and I was like, Oh, it's a bit you know, hesitant. Um, of change, I was kind of that way, a bit shy and, and things as a kid. Um, so we decided to go, and I, I, yeah. I went in, in fourth form and in, in year ten, and you know I didn't school didn't really capture me. I didn't enjoy it, and I think um, you know I was in the bus at seven a.m. and you know an hour in the bus to get there, hour home, home at five or whatever, um, yeah. and then the days that you're training after school for things. So. Um, it, you know, it was different, and it was a different group of people. It wasn't my mates. It wasn't South Auckland, I guess, in some way. Um, uh, so mm. like I struggled. Yeah. A little. I, I definitely struggled. Um, you know, I probably lost connection with a, lot, with a few people. Um, and I said to my parents after a few weeks, mm. or probably a, after my month or so, I said, "Oh, look, I don't want to do this." You know, um, and. You know, my parents took me around yeah, and said, hey, look, right. if, you know, we'll stick out the year. You know, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, we feel this, you know, try it out, have a go. So, okay, okay, I'll do that. So I did the year. And, like, I played second 15 rugby in year 10. So I'm playing with seven formers. Um, you know, I'm playing the Otahuhu colleges, the, <laughs> you know, the first 15s of these guys. Like, I'm playing some big boys and I'm yeah. this skinny guy. Jeez. And the rugby was cool. I was playing second 11 cricket as well. So, But the thing was, I'm playing, like I'm year 10, kind of in this foreign school, playing with these 18-year-olds. And I'm a 14-year-old who's, yeah. they're off going to parties after the games. And, you know, my dad's then driving me home. <laughs> <laughs> going to read Harry Potter. Read Harry so, Potter. <laughs> um, it's, um, so it's, you know, I think in some ways it was great. You know, it's kind of good for my kind of sport life, I guess, and, and, and things to be able to play against older um, opposition and stuff. But, you know, socially I kind of realised, like, hey, this, you know, if I had to be, I think, yeah, it might have been great for my sport, but, you know, I probably had the value on me where I actually valued um, my connections and my friends a lot more. So um, I said, to my parents and, and I think they were a little bit gutted because mm. they thought this was, you know, they obviously maybe thought I had a chance at, you know, doing something with my sport. But I was like, oh, I can't, you know, I've, I've got to go back to Rosal. So I <laughs> um, ended up, yeah, after that year, went back to Rosal for my last three years at high school and, um, 
and literally went from St. Kent's that has, you know, 25, 30 rugby teams to Roseville College that has one rugby team <laughs> out of 2,000, 2000 kids, you know, has a first 15 yeah. and you scrape together <laughs> to get that first 15 because, you know, the kids yeah. aren't there that, you know, there's no, they're really disciplined to play sport or anything yeah. in, in the school. Um, but I, I feel um, in terms of what, shaped me into how I was and as an all back and as a person, as a dad, um, you know, I think it's yeah. probably one of my, you know, tough, you know, looking back, probably a, a pretty big decision, but I feel it was one of the best decisions because I, you know, it's in great times in there mm. um, and you had to go a slightly different path to try and make these, um, you know, the, the rugby teams and, and, and what have you, um, because you're not seeing, no one's, no one's watching you every week. Um, you're just this kid that, you know, plays for this team that, you know, wins half its games, um, plays Wesley's second 15, so you're not even playing their top 15 because otherwise we'll get beaten by 100 points. So um, mm. it was, uh, you yeah, know, it was it was awesome. I actually <laughs> loved it. And that was probably some of the best times of my, my life, you know, playing first 15 for three years there and played with my older brother. He was my captain. And, nice. Um, so, and that was, yeah, and that was oh, awesome. awesome. That was actually really cool because, you know, we'd had a bit of a, you know, I think a tumultuous relationship for a long time. <laughs> um, well, he basically beat me up because um, I always wanted to do well against them. So, um, but yeah, playing together and, and going to parties together and yeah. you know, he'd give me a beer and stuff and, and things like that. Um, yeah, it was awesome and, and pretty cool to to have. And I, I think that's created a, a real a real love for it and, and slightly different to say that. The rugby schools and mm. um, that are, that are now, especially and even probably back then, yeah. was, was pretty full on. So um, I'm pretty glad I, um, the pathway, you know, got to me where I needed to get to. I guess in, in some ways. Yeah, oh. that's awesome. What, what position, oh, if you don't mind? What position like were you playing at Saint Kent's, Kieran? Mm. Mm. Six or something. Yeah, playing a flanker. Yeah, open yeah. side. Wow. So, awesome. I, so one. One st- one, yeah. so I, and it was some I big boys too. Would have been. <laughs> in the morning, and then I had to go yep. and sit on the bench for the first fifteen um, against. Uh, I think it was Max. I'm pretty sure it was Max. And um, you know, you're 14 years old. Wow! And yeah, yeah. You turn up there, and so St. Kent's was awesome. Like they had the Arthur brothers. They had oh, um, their own Joe Rock and that playing in the first and they were like rock stars and, and I was just like oh, right. turned up sitting and you know already played maybe minutes <laughs> then just in the bang room I was like oh don't get on <laughs> I was like didn't really want to get on so I was like I don't want to you know make a fool of myself a little bit um, and I actually didn't get put on um, in the game but um, yeah just playing against big guys and I, I had a season of that and I probably always have you know like I was like I'm a, and I had a, so I always felt like I was playing big guys and I had that mentality when I, when I made it and when I got big, yeah. I didn't actually believe I was big, you know, so you still play with that little bit of skinny and white boy mentality. <laughs> um, I think that probably helped me as well. And, well, that's kind of how I played that physical nature of, mm. you know, cause you always just played against these bigger guys, um, yeah. growing up. That's, um, that's actually quite interesting cause I, I, I'm wondering if, like, as it translated that into, say, your uh, Super Rugby and, and then into your All Black career, did you ever, like, look to go, well, I feel, this is how I feel, or right? well, this is how I see myself, so therefore, you're big, I'm going to dominate you. Did, did, did you have that type of mentality? Would, would that be fair? Yeah, to be fair, it was, yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, you know, and it probably wasn't mm. till some of my coaches, like, I think my co- um you know, I made the All Blacks and Steve Hanson was like, you're a big guy. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, I don't think I am. Like, like, you know, he's like, you can go. And so you got to use the, the size. But I was like, man, I was just always kind of um, would come up against people. And, you know, I really enjoyed the whole mentality of testing mm. yourself. Yeah. So, you know, as, when I was younger, I'd look out for the big guy and try and tackle him. And, you know, there's years where you did that and, you know, everyone else in my team knew that's what I wanted to do. So, um, 
you kind of just yeah it was like you know back in the day it was like it was on the beach you know, <laughs> and, and put it, um, south park there it was like the biggest guy is going to run on the, you know tad bit he's yeah. going to get the ball and run straight up and that's that was rugby and so walking that was it just on the burst the wreck line and it was like yeah yeah, yeah. biggest guy and you're best tackler and so i was out best tackler and so it was the biggest guy and me and so every, every week i loved it and it was so it's um, you know, just what you, you did. And I think that's what I, you know, really brought um, as I, you know, made it into yeah. Crusaders and, and the you, you didn't um You didn't do a Quade Cooper at any stage. You know, just pushed their head down into the ground at, or neat. <laughs> oh, no. Nah, nah, no, no, nah. nothing like that? No, nah, I, was, I, was, I, was, I think I was pretty, um, pretty yeah. fair. I'd go hard, but um, yeah, nothing else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, I think it was one of the World Cups, you guys are playing <clears throat> one of the, I guess, one of the, the lower ranked teams. And man, I forget the country, <laughs> the players on there saying that they were looking forward to getting smashed by Kieran Reid. <laughs> it was yeah. one of the players that spoke about it. He was just looking forward and excited to get tackled by Kieran Reid. And um, I guess that sort of ties into my question here. And well, sorry if we jump around a little bit, but I'm just really intrigued and love and just grateful to have you on the was there ever a player that you saw at any stage whether that's from high school or whether that's <clears> in your professional career uh, whether it's crusaders or whether that's international as an all black we look at another team and um that other one of the other players <laughs> yeah, just you, and you a good one tackled you good and you thought i'm going to get that person back and and yeah and a couple of things um, yeah, yeah. who was that um, and did you get the back Oh, I think it, yeah, there's definitely been times where I've been hit, I've been hit well, man. Um, 100%. Well, probably, I think, yeah. um, <laughs> and you go, I reckon it was probably, it definitely happened at, at high school. Uh, I don't remember the opposition, but, you know, you'd always be looking to, yeah. to get that, that guy back. Yeah. Um, and it's really hard, but I think um, <laughs> it was probably the one for me was Serafka. So, um when I was kind of coming in early days, Pierce Beast was probably the world's best mm. number. Um, and he was a beast. Like he was yeah. like immense, you know, fast, yeah. and like a winger playing number eight. Yeah. 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 So for me, it was like, yeah. <laughs> I'd seen him do damage and we played him for Colts. I played Colts against him um, in a semi-final um, in France. Wow. And he just destroyed us. Like, and so since then, it's kind of been, oh, you know, and he was, that year he was playing for the Springboks, I think, basically. You know, he was that, that good. Um, and so, you know, from that yeah. point, I was like, oh, I was, and he was, you know, obviously doing on international, but I just wanted to, you know, test myself against him, you know, and get him. So, um, and I think, yeah, he managed to do that. Over, okay. But it was just like, he could hit you too. So it was it was all good good stuff. Well, uh, yeah. well I like that. And it's, um, it, it, uh, it's, awesome. it actually paints in, in this last few moments just the, your um, your journey and, and, and how it's gone. And I really love the, that you've talked about a couple of things that um, your know, talent comes through the repetition of, of your skill and, and basically you work at it. I mean, I'm pretty sure we've seen, it doesn't matter what sport, we've seen super talented athletes, people, but they haven't put in the effort in some way. And, 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 and unfortunately, they, they just don't flourish as much as, as they would like to the potential. <clears throat> But also like the um, that you've taken a different path. <clears throat> this is not about um, St. Kent's or um, or whatever the rugby schools and going down that route or through mm. perhaps through an academy or whatever. But finding a different path that works for you because you, you know you value those connections. So, um, what I'm really interested to to explore on this bit is is um, mm. who's your biggest influence? It sounds like your parents and it sounds like your dad for sure. But who was the biggest? Who who else were big influences in your your career? Yeah, look, it's probably um, definitely mm. my dad. I think had an impact. Um, more of us around, like he was just yeah. there. You know, he was never a vocal, um, very vocal supporter in terms of pushing and stuff. But he obviously knew the spark was there. So like, I was watching on TV last night, and they had the Blues '96 final. Um, they were showing that on. Um, on Sky, and I was like, we were there. My dad took me oh. to that game, you know, the eleven year old kid. And, um, we know we'd go wow. to most of the Blues games early on when the county school, <laughs> um, and go to Pookie Stadium and watch footy. And um, you know, when he took me to rugby games or, or things, you know, he wouldn't dissect the game. 
he, you know, he wouldn't be that person, but he'd just yeah. be there and, and support you. So that's mm -hmm. definitely, um, and I try and mirror that a little bit now with my kids. Which is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I could do it. Sit, sit there and not mirror yeah. the game. <laughs> so, what were you thinking? Home from that ball of hockey. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, my, my girls are like, <laughs> <laughs> they're doing I'm something. Like, oh, about this sort, you know? I'm like, don't try and tell them how to play this. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Film have you got them sitting down doing film reviews? Yeah. So, film uh, but, um, yeah. So, like, I honestly, yeah. So it's, it's pretty impressive how he did that. So, um, but yeah, uh, he's he's one. Um, awesome. And then as I went to high school, like at Rosewood College, so as as I said, there was you know no um, extra stuff that was put into, but we had a um, PE teacher who was kind of head of sport. Um, James Fraser, his name, and he kind of created a bit of an elite sport program in Rosehall for like my last year or two, um, and he saw something in me. So in my seventh form year, uh, he would come in like he's he lived in town in Auckland, and he'd drive down early, and he'd meet me at seven a.m. or seven thirty on the field and hold a hip pad for me, wow. um, and we'd do extra training because, but you know, oh, yeah. there was no one else in our team at school that you know potentially could have you know carried on like it was just it was wanted a fun to do team. better guys wanted to do well but yeah um you know our trainings were different our trainings went like probably a lot of other schools so he said yep i'm gonna do this for you um so you know twice a week you know we'd turn up early and then i'd go and have a shower at one of my mates house um then go to school um you know and he'd be there and just you know we'd just tackle and be wow. practice tackling getting up jackling the ball or running, doing all this extra training. That if he wasn't there, I wouldn't have ever. I wouldn't have done it. I don't think. Um, and so he pushed me. And also, also through school, you know, I was skinny. So he's like, "We got to put some weight on you." <laughs> um, so he's like, managed to get you know, a, um, I don't know. A, something so I could go to the canteen and pick up a chicken roll and a primo <laughs> <every day>. <laughs> nice. um, hookups <laughs> so it was wow well. um, so I could go and pick up a primo and a chicken roll and, and on top of my lunch that my parents so I'd be smacking like Sammy like because I just have a ham Sammy and stuff and, and have a chicken roll and primo like eating a lot of food just to try and put on a bit of weight um, and yeah. then you know and man it worked you know yeah. like I um like starting that year, I didn't even know about a national secondary school team mm. or a tournament. Like mm. I didn't know about it. You know, I hadn't been in any um, teams before or hadn't been to any trials. And then, so you just play for your school. And then I played for counties all through the age groups. I played plenty of representative teams, but yeah, you know, I didn't know about the New Zealand teams. Um, and then, so played for counties in this tournament. It was basically Wesley first fifteen plus me um, in the in the county's team, um, you know, and then I made this Northern Regions team, um, and so made Northern Regions. And I was like, oh, that's awesome, you know, national tournament, play these coolers in Rotorua, and then uh, yeah, kind of went down there and played well and um, uh, made New Zealand secondary schools and and out of kind of nowhere really, I guess. Um, and there's probably a, a couple other guys from kind of random schools, but yeah, not too many, eh, from um, the small schools. So, um, yeah, and from there, I guess you get, <clears throat> yeah, you go, yeah, I can do it, you know, and you can do it through your own pathway. So, yeah, he, he had a big impact um, in that space, and like I'm still connected to him now, you know, as, as good mates and good friends. So, um, Another guy from school, my tutor teacher, That's Merrick, awesome. was, was there too. So those guys drove from Auckland to Wellington to watch me play for New Zealand wow. secondary schools. Um, yeah, so yeah. pretty cool, way eh, when your teachers are doing that. So, um, yeah, so like that. And then I, I think I reckon. as you move on, man, there's been so many great rugby mentors mm -hmm. for me um, coming down to Canterbury. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, there's plenty through the academy all the way through. All my coaches have been great. Um, and in different ways and yeah really in different ways yeah. Um, and yeah I could rattle off a lot of them um, and you and you and you pick up heaps from yeah. different things yeah. from different people away um, but yeah it's, it's special yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
Man, awesome. That's so cool. And, and I just wanted to ask, yeah, Mr. Fraser. You had, sure, was it Mr. Out. Fraser, yes. did you say? Mr. And Merrick? Still there. Ah, shout out to those two guys. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. And did you, so going through that and experiencing that, and as Brian mentioned, and as you highlighted, going through your own pathway and then realizing, when, when was that point at, when you thought, um, or did somebody speak to you, or when was there ever a point where you thought, "Man, I, I'd love to go for the All Blacks," or I, or you, where you remember having this, I guess, unwavering belief that, yeah, hey, I, I can do this. Was there ever a point that you can pin that down um, to? Well, I'll tell you another story for you, um, mm-hmm. about my days there at high school. So, yeah, in our, my, our, my sixth form year, um, Rose, where we we fundraised and we went over to Gold Coast and played it. Um, play like a carnival um, tournament. Um, and it's the first yep. time a team from Rosewood had, had done this. Um, and so it was just, and those were all my best mates oh, yeah. and just us going over there and having fun. And so it, it required me to um, not be available for, you know, representative for counties and stuff like, and, and do this. And I was, and so it was a, oh, a no brainer. Right. Like I was happy to not, you know, represent, <laughs> go play for secondary schools and stuff. Um, so I played that, and then when it came back, there was a um, must have been counties bees, I think. Um, and James, so Mr. Fraser had said, "Oh, look, he got me in there for this game because um, he wanted the selectors to have a look." Um, and yeah. so after the game, like I didn't know, and then um, after the game, selector obviously James spoke to him, and the guy said, "Oh, he should just stick to cricket." <laughs> talking about me um and i'm not sure if really? Jane, when he told me this and I, it's a bit blurry now if he told me straight away <clears> or he just waited for the right moment and 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 just planted that seed in me yeah. um and so this is when i was yeah six, six form and then came back the next year and he put all this yeah. investment into me from that point i guess um you know so mm. yeah so that's where probably it was like okay well, and there's probably, there's always been people like that, yeah. you know, um, doubting you. Yeah. Um, and doubting, yeah. being from where I'm from and being from the school, from Rosal College and being in this, in this small um, town and, and things and counties, and, um, you know, you adapted because you didn't win everything all the time. So, um, and it made you want to prove yourself a little bit. So um, I think that, you know, that motivated me. Um, making that New Zealand Second Schools rugby mm. team got, was like a, oh, wow, yep, this could happen. I still didn't really think about it in terms of the All Blacks. And then it just flowed from there. I um I got a good mate, Onasai <clears throat> Ova, who's, um, who played New Zealand. So he won gold medals for New Zealand Sevens, um, played for the Blues, went overseas and, and things. Yeah. Um, so we played a lot together growing up. And uh, n- under-19s trials, um, he came up with my nickname, which was nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it was for a lot of. He, he, kind of, he said, kind of, I who I was. Um, but then he also, you know, I think he tried to appease me by saying, oh, nobody um, could touch me. Oh, nobody was as good. I think it was more the fact that nobody knew who I was when I turned up to these trials because you know, I come from nowhere. So, um, Cheeky, man. Um, but you know, so I kind of just. just me i had to just be quiet and as i said i didn't know everyone everyone else knew everyone because i'd been part mm. of these schools or whatever so um yeah, i was just right. there turning up trying to do my yeah. thing and um and then as you gain a bit of success and gain some time and and suddenly you're starting ahead of these other boys who are, who are pretty damn good um you're thinking to yourself shit how's that happened um <laughs> you know <laughs> You know, maybe I'm, I do or something, you know, so yeah, it's it a <laughs> right. bit of that. Yeah. That, that, that is actually quite fascinating because awesome. you can hear it. It's like, well, I'm not going to let these, the doubters can doubt, but I'm not going to let them get to me. I'm going to use them to motivate me to go forward and to drive. And But what I like, yeah. as you, you you talked about that, is the, the humility that comes through as this. Well, look, I'm going to play that kind of like that gray man role a little bit, just play my lane, do my thing, and just keep working on it. So I just want to, Fast forward just a little bit because um, 
well, I actually want to talk about my beloved Hurricanes, but that's going to go not happen at the moment. Like, see, Joe, Joe's shaking his head. No, I think he'll edit that part out, perhaps. Not on but, this, not on this um, podcast. We were, Joe and I yeah, were just no. talking before you came on, um, Karen, <laughs> and there's the the book, uh, Legacy by James Kerr, and um, it talks about a lot of the stuff that behind the scenes of, of, of what you do. But there's one part in mm. there that um, it's called sweeping mm. the sheds or or after the game. And I want to, I guess, just lead now in, into that kind of that leadership space. And so the question then is the, the sweeping the sheds after the game, is this a myth or is it a reality? And if it is reality, how do you see that contributing to leadership and teamwork? Yeah, look, it, you know, it's, it's definitely happens. Um, you know, so it's basically, you know, it's any good mm team or person you know you come in you leave the place in a, in a tidier mm. state than when you found it so um that's really for us when we turn up into a shed and after the game and uh, we will go around and make sure it, it's spotless for us and um and that you know as you say it is only it's a little thing eh? and but it's creating a, a habit for the whole team to see that hey we're not bigger than anyone here you know like the cleaner who comes in has to dart doing their job we're doing our job you know if we we're disrespecting them if we're not mm. you know helping them out <clears throat> um and it's around the whole mm. notion of um you know doing your bit eh? i think so the other part of it um it is going okay yeah and as i think in the legacy it talks about the leaders doing that and so thing is when the leaders mm. are seen then mm. everyone will follow um and so the leaders are doing these little things and it's it's creating um, who we are as people, as all blacks. It's about doing, you know, doing a good thing. Um, and if you didn't do that, hey, it might not affect your performance, but over time it might just affect <clears throat> a little bit of mindset around who we are and, and what we really value. So I think it's very important. Mm. Um, and yeah, it, it happened over my entire career. Um, I'm sure it will still be happening. That's that is that that's that's Beautiful. really ties in with the culture, right? And 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 the I guess that culture eats strategy and all the plans and all the all the things that I, I can imagine would happen in, in in at the top tier of of you know being with the All Blacks, right? So all the film sessions that that Joe was alluding to that you want to do with your kids, <laughs> all, all that stuff yeah. that happens with the All Blacks, but these little things. <laughs> create the culture and if the culture i can only imagine that if the culture is yep. positive then everything else falls in with that and of course there's other things that you need to to, to bring into to line with that so there's also in the um in that book that it talks about um the blue head red head yeah and it came that 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 mindset because I'm, I'm glad you talked about it and touched on that that mindset space mm. so so for you as a player how did you keep your um i hope i get the right color blue head and how do you see this relating to you, yeah. um, not only sport, but to, to leadership? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> like, I feel I was reasonably lucky in the fact that mm. I'm pretty level-headed. Um, and I probably always have been. Um, and I've been able to kind of deal with things, you know, fairly, um, you know, uh, not nonchalantly, mm. but just being able to adapt, you know. Um, and not get too thrown off course yep. by certain things that have happened. Um, but most definitely, um, you realise that no matter how good you are at this, there's times in a game where you get thrown off your, or you make a mistake <laughs> and you want to try and fix that mistake. So now you're focusing on fixing the mistake, not focusing on mm. you know your role in the team. Um, and so yeah. when kind of Kerry Evans brought this in, it kind of changed our whole mentality as a team you know around mm. um, our mental model um so as you say it's like a you've got a red head that's your tribal brain it's it's your primitive brain so man if you see danger it's going to engage if you make a mistake it's probably going to engage and it's going to go you know freeze fight fight or flight so you're either going to get real aggressive yeah. or you're going to try and get out of there um and that's not going to help in anyone um when you're on, on a rugby field or let alone anywhere um, you know, making a decision and for a business or, or anything. So um, in the blue head, you're clear and you're calm and you can make good decisions. Um, 
And so, yeah, it's been about, it's not been able to stay in the blue head all the time because, you know, you're a freak <laughs> if, you, if you're doing that, because um, that's not going to happen. It's been able to recognize when you go to the red and you go and you're, you're off and you go, okay, what's the tools I can have? So um, the tools to get from right. the red back into the blue mm. as quickly as possible. And so in reality, for me, once I kind of figured this out, I could, it was probably, I'd say, under a second wow. for me to go from being here to being in, and this is on the field, you know. So basically you wouldn't tell that I've, gone into the red um so I'd, I'd have a couple of yeah uh, some i just basically talk to myself i had had some self-talk um mantra that i had which was basically it just said to myself next task and there was a, <laughs> a swear word in there um, um and if i needed to to see perspective i'd look into the like to the far end of the stadium and look up into the and just so then i could see wow. everything and suddenly Suddenly mm. you're not focused on this one thing. So just doing that, looking there and saying, you know, next time, and then bang, I was, and, you know, you might use that once couple, once or twice a game when you're really, um, you know, in that state. Um, if you if it wasn't too bad, if it just something had happened and you can just always use the mantra of it as well anyway, if you've made a mistake or if something's happened. Um, so individually, yes. everyone had their own, own thing and you have to realise what, you know, what worked for you. Um, and so it's important that happened and then it just brought the connection together it's like suddenly you had a bit more empathy for everyone else because you realised because you could witness um, some of your teammates like Aaron Smith for example played so much footy with him and he kind of he's mm. like once I, we learnt about this stuff man I could <laughs> tell when he was going to read you know see how he <laughs> in the red all the time yeah I thought he was always read <laughs> I've got quite a relationship, eight, nine relationship with him. And so it's going, okay, mate, yeah. I can, so I could just say to him, I had, you know, whatever he wanted, he had a key word that he wanted me to say to him, Nuggy, this, you know, bang. And then suddenly he'd go, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he'd, um, you know, realize what he's, what awesome. he's doing. So, um, you know, yeah, you could, yeah, knowing yourself, you could then see it in, in others and try and, and try and help um, the guys around you as well. Um, mm. And that mental framework, you know, it seems really simple um, to create. But suddenly if you've got guys all in, in the right framework, because one person who's not in a, a rugby team can derail mm. an entire, an entire team. So, mm. yeah, just getting everyone on the same page, eh? That that is that is awesome because you're talking about um, communication, awesome. you're talking about culture, you're talking about the whole mindset, particularly when you're under pressure and under the pump. And we've seen that time and again over over the years, um, yep. where you know the, the All Blacks have been put under the pump, even from um, the expectation of the public. And and I, I want to fast forward a little bit if this is okay, because um, this has reminded me of this. And, and this is the 2011 World Rugby World Cup in, in New Zealand, and this is. Was it is it the the team of five million or something team of four million? I, I forget what the the phrasing was that Martin Sneddon used or the the people that put that together. But you're in the final and you're playing France and and um, it's a bit of an arm wrestle. And like most of New Zealand, I think we're all kind of we're all sweaty with you because it's like oh man, you're like on the edge of your seat. And I, I think my kids were standing on the chairs at, at one stage and and, and, and looking at it. but. Such a pivotal moment for New Zealand rugby because the whole expectation, like, you know, we've bombed out of the World Cup for a long time since the first one to then. So, yeah. how did you deal with that collectively as a team? Because knowing that this is all on you, I mean, yeah. as a team, yeah, how did you deal with that? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, 100%. Now, as you said, like, I think, um, <clears throat> I think leading up to it, we've done a little bit of work on this stuff, um, not a lot on this red to blue stuff but more the more work we yeah. did actually was about mm. what pressure means you know and what it's going to do to you mm. and really what we were going to do with it you know and so our mindset became walking towards the pressure um and actually embracing it you know like hey we're the lucky ones who wouldn't want to be yeah. playing in a home world cup you know like it's probably one of your dreams if you want to play for the all blacks you want to play yeah. in the world cup you want to play at home and we're the 
you know, probably yeah. one of the, maybe the, the last All Black team that maybe gets to play at home in a World Cup, you know, like, um, so really just reframing that entire, um, the entire language of, you know, what that expectation and pressure means because um, there's no getting around the fact that you knew that <laughs> yeah, yeah. literally everyone wanted you to win. And yes. <laughs> so much pressure and literally, like, it was unreal that World Cup. Like, the fans were just, it was a team of four or five million um, outside the hotel. Just never happens, any, you know, any other week never happens. Mm. There's just hundreds of people there you know, watching us off on the bus and everywhere you went, it was just crazy, you know. Like, um, so it was, and so, yeah, that pressure was there, 100% it was there. And so it wasn't saying, no, we're not going to deal with the pressure and just push it to the side. It was like, okay, we'll take the pressure and we'll go, okay, this is awesome because we want, we actually really want this. Um, and so we're going to, you know, we're going to definitely walk towards it. We're going to embrace that stuff and go, Yep, if we went here, there's someone else who, who would love to be here and doing it. So, um, but man, <laughs> that final though, and geez, that bus ride was the most nervous I've ever been in my, in my rugby career. Probably. Um, yeah, man, just like lined with fans and I just yelling, yeah, screaming the whole way was on the bus, and you're just going, oh, don't f it up, you know, like. And so it was a really strange one, eh? Trying to trying to really mm. keep caps on that emotion of it all, you know, like around. And so I was, yeah, as I said, real nervous um, in that final outside of the game. But every time I mm. stepped on in those yeah. white lines, suddenly I, became, I was real calm and just, I guess, all the work you've done pre previously. And it's like, okay, this is, you know, this is my arena, you know, like this is where I belong. Um, yeah you know, inside those white lines. And then like half time came, you run off in the shed and then suddenly I was like shaking and but then and stuff and kind of like freaking out a little bit. Uh, but you run back on the field and then wow. suddenly like another calmness comes over over me and it's like, man, yeah. So um so I can definitely <laughs> a little bit of what the fans were going. But on, honestly on the field it was it was um it was slightly different. It was um it was calm. It wasn't like we we're definitely going to win, but it was like, yeah, we're pretty um, in a yeah. good mindset and in a good space. That's incredible, man. That, that's awesome. I, I, I remember that. I think every probably New Zealander remembers where they were, but I was still in Perth at that time during that World Cup. And, and I remember you, you just sort of cast my mind back listening to you speak. And it's really cool to hear that even – an elite level mm, professional mm. athlete playing for the All Blacks can feel those, I guess, butterflies or whatever people want to call it. But then you get into that environment as you reference the white lines yeah. and you're just able to flick that switch and you understand your role, your job, and you trust all the men around you and that team that you have. Um, but I remember because you guys played France in the pool rounds leading up to that, and you guys <laughs> crashed them, I was like, we got this easy. They're going to yeah. smash them. That's what was. That was my mindset just because, well, A, because of I looked at that game, but also B, because I really wanted the All Blacks to smash them <laughs> yeah. because of you know, what had happened in previous ones. And I was like, yeah, get them. But um, I remember sitting, I had to go to a meeting and then I rang my wife and she was getting <laughs> I was sitting in the car. I was like, Don't need to, I didn't need to go in yet. So I was getting oh. updates. I didn't get to see it. I was getting updates over the phone. It's like, Who's got the ball? She's got the All Blacks have got the ball. What's the score? It's still yeah. eight seven or whatever it was. And I was like, <laughs> All right, tell me, tell me when the, how much time is left. And she we were just going through all of that. Yeah. She was cracking up. But she was also stressed because yeah. I was stressing her out. Because yeah. I was telling her, like barking at her over the phone, like, who's got the ball now? How much time is left? But man, listening yeah. to you speak, it just brought back those memories. And I was so stoked that you fellas won. It wasn't at you that set up, you caught the ball in the line, it wasn't? Threw the ball down. Yeah, was so it you that caught I that? I'm um, trying to remember now. To yeah, set up the no, try. I catch it, but I um at the line so out. was uh, one of I called I called the line out. So um, so I was scoring the line out, and it was one that of was those awesome. ones where you um you mm. come up with this like a special line out, and yeah. you literally need everything to work perfectly for it to come off. And some sometimes, you know, um, <laughs> and I've had a few come off over my career because I and I come up with the line out yeah. calls and stuff. And this this move uh, we did with um, Steve Hansen, Mick Byrne, and myself, we we like 
Yeah. Okay, like France, jump. So they put like two jumpers up. So they take out six players by trying to do yep. that. So if we can win the ball here, then there's a gap between them. You know, there's a gap between them. Yeah, so gotcha. It, um, wow. When we kicked it out to the line out and it went out, mm. like just inside 22, and it was about perfect. I still going to jump. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is it. We'll call it. So we called it and then just had to, you know, it just honestly it just worked out perfectly. So it was this amazing feeling for that to happen. Yeah. Um, and you can see that yeah. reaction eh, when Woody's going over and everyone's back. Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's kinda of funny, man. Like when that when that happens, Perfect. it's probably mm. for me one of the some some good feelings. There's another one, I think in twenty twelve or fourteen yeah. in South Africa, Alice Park. Yeah. And South Africa? Richie scores. Yeah. Through another yeah. kind of fake move and then he scores through the middle and kind of gets he comes from <laughs> half right. and catches the ball and goes through and scores. Um, another one like that yeah, just one that was like awesome. kind of from doing all your analysis on the opposition like for me like I, in line out like you'd spend quite a Damn. bit of time like analysing how they defend the line out yeah. to, to try and win the ball best and then you go okay they're going to do this here we do this like this is pretty out of it but it could yeah, be it was, yeah. And, you know when it does it's it, was, like, it was interesting like when that um, I think in that walk, <laughs> the first one you um, that you, you described and, and the little picks or the little screens that you set to, to seal off the, the channel. Because I, 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 yeah. I didn't yeah. notice that until I watched the replay. I was like, hey, that's what they did. And, and, and just but seeing that work, and I remember that emotion. But the most enduring moment, well, actually two. One is, is you know, obviously Richie um, with his, his bung ankle. Actually three. And um, Stephen Donald, who's come on with his, his you know, crop top jersey. <laughs> I'm sure he got some stick for that. Yeah. But it, it's yeah. it's it's this, and the, who, um, I want you to, to um to try and guess who this player is. He's he's coaching yeah, Brad Thorne. You do this oh, the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was good at that one. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that was brilliant. All right, so just coming back, and I'm, thank you for for sharing that, and, and I really love that, and how you say you talk about walking towards pressure. Yeah. And then we got to embrace it, and and this is something that that is relevant to to all of us. Um, whether you're an All Black, whether you're a, um, somebody that's just starting their working career, or whether you're you're um, a young person, or you're in corporate, it doesn't matter. But it's finding that pressure and walking to it, not ignoring it. It's there. We need to find a way to deal with that. And thank you for sharing some of those insights. So, I guess I just want to. Um, jump into a few of these these things if that's okay and and, and bring this back into that again how you were thinking how you would um approach this but i'm going to jump around a little bit in these world cups but there is one um in particular and it's a 2019 world cup and a semi-final with england and you know we we talk about um yeah, the, i think the formation had changed with the hucket into the arrowhead and all of a sudden England come up with the, the the crescent shape, and it did look like, and, and I haven't watched that game since then, to be honest. But, um, but it did look like that the, the the team looked like, well, where am I looking? Because prior to that, you know, when we do the hockey like this, you know, you focus on a point. But now we've got that. D- did that have an impact? Do you think on on the way you approach it as a team, or was that just something? Oh, okay, cool, bring it anyway. Nah, it was um, yeah, yeah. It's basically one of those kind of okay, cool moments, you know. Like for me, I, um, I actually yeah. enjoyed yeah. teams doing something like that, you know, like mm. um, yeah, having yeah, their own you response know, like, sort of thing, and like. it was respectful, yeah. you know. It wasn't like they, you know, France yeah. 2011, they came right up to us, and so it was, and that's cool too, you know. Like it's like okay, you know, and they wore their different coloured things. So when England did that, it's like okay, yep, mm. it's pretty cool. It's kind of going okay, they're here to at a party and they said were and so it was like boys okay look what you know once we've finished the haka it's you come back in you have a little huddle and you go okay boys we you know it's on here um so i really appreciated that i'm not sure what everyone else felt but i think that's it's a good thing you know like um because it is a good an awesome part of the game is haka and us doing it um you know Mm. properly and it's got better hasn't it Mm. over the years um yeah and, um, 100%. <laughs> you know, because we're paying it respect that it deserves, you know. So, um, 
yeah, it's uh, yeah, I think it's just one of those ones, eh? Um, yeah. yeah, they were like, yeah, nice. they were on. And this we're is something on. that um, okay, I want to ask. Sorry, yeah. Joe. Um, they yeah. the, the want to ask, and this is from my son, actually, my son Elijah. So shout out to Elijah. Yeah. He goes, the first time that you yeah. led the haka, yeah. when when you were given, how did you feel about that, and yep. what was some of the things that you were experiencing, um, seeing mm-hmm. by doing that, or doing that? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think over the last, yeah. you know, my last few years of my career, I was kind of like, I really enjoyed doing the haka and I wanted to learn and, and felt like, um, mm. in conjunction with like TJ Pitanara, who was leading it for us. Like, so I did a bit of work with him, um, to get to the point where I could lead it. Um, nice. and really it was more just like, yep, this is, you know, he said, yep, mm. you've got the, all the mana and respect to do it. Um, You've done it justice and in, in respect of, of how you do it. Um, so it was like, yeah, I'm the leader of the team and with alongside TJ, you know, in terms of this. Um, and it was an interesting, like, it was a massive honor to, to lead the haka. And it was, yeah, I think mm. the whole connection that Māori have, you know, into the ancestors and through the land. And um, for me, being a Pākehā, you know, like, you know, you don't fully understand it, but when you lead a haka, it's, yeah. um, I can, yeah, I can, I can feel it. I could feel, um, mm-hmm. you know, people helping me out, you know, it was, um, so yeah, it was, uh, yeah, really, really special and really cool moment. That's awesome. I, I wanted to ask, and thank you very much for sharing that, Kieran. I, like, probably just jumping into some of the stuff, which I think B's going to speak about anyway, but hearing <coughs> those things and, and obviously, as you mentioned and touched on, it's gotten better over the years, the haka and stuff itself. Where, like, because you were in the team for such a long period of time, obviously we've seen that transformation and, and it seems to be that the respect, the, the humility has always been there from what yeah. I could see from afar, looking at the All Blacks and stuff on television, just through the interviews, the way you conduct yourselves when you're having media, press conferences and all that sort of stuff and other things in general that would pop up on social media and things like that. But from, a, I guess, the the cultural perspective or the Māori, specifically the Māori aspects um, that you guys apply and, and connect to as a team, where did that, or can you remember mm-hmm. how and where that started to come into play? Was it already mm-hmm. established by the time you made it to the All Blacks or was it something that you saw start to develop and build whilst you were a part of the team? Yeah, I think it had started, you know, I think when Kapo Pongo, um, Haka, um, yeah. you know, when they came up with that in 2005, came up. I believe. Um, yeah. That was probably mm. the restart of, you know, for us paying homage to Haka and, and Māori and, and doing that. And um, oh, When I came in, it was based around Haka. So, but then I think as we grew and then maybe post 11, like in 12 to 15, um, we started coming up with a concept of a whare, you know, like for us, you know, like when we traveled, we took our whare with us. And so our team room in the hotel that week, you know, we'd decorate it with our, um, you know, we had like a big poster that looked like a marae and had posts that had different yeah. pillars and, and things. And, yeah. and, you know, that put up <clears throat> things that to do with home, you know, like things like to do with New Zealand. Um, around this team room so we could connect to it and so it was more just like for us of going yep um, this is who we are and this is um, our connection to home even though we're around the other side of the world Um, and so that became quite powerful um, and we probably just connected a bit better with with that with um, the Maori side and then having like Mm -hmm. Salia Messam and our team you know Mm -hmm. and it just little things but him like getting up and you know saying some whakatokis, but you know, before a meeting, you know, like just doing that and it just connects you back, you know, to, you know, to, to us as, as a country and, and to Māori and, um, yeah. So I think it wow. definitely has grown um, that, over that time. That's, that's actually um, amazing to hear. Thanks, to, 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 and I like that idea. Yeah. You, you took your fuddy with you. you know, it's like you, you, I can imagine you know, you're going overseas, you're traveling a lot, right? So it'd be quite easy to yeah. to go. Oh, okay, we're a team, and the, yeah, we got to do ten yeah. things in a team hotel. This is a foreign place, yeah. but to be able to create that piece of New Zealand in your space, uh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Well, that's it mm. because we, we literally didn't have a ho- like we don't have a 
home ground like England does or Wales and all those teams, you know, like we play everywhere around New Zealand, which is which is great. Like Eden Park's probably our you know, our home home, but you play there maybe once or twice a year. So yeah, finding that ability mm. to connect back to who and if the fuddy with that is the all black fuddy, you know, that's what it is. It, it's mm. a it's a travelling fuddy that goes around and um if you oh, wanted awesome. to connect you go in there and just and chill out, you know. Who's who's responsible for making sure that all those pieces for your guys' fare when you travel and it mm. gets put up? Is that the yeah, manager so that or was, was that um, the yeah, daughter? Gilbert Anoka was yep. a big driver of yep. that year as kind of the nice. you know leadership manager, you know mental skills. So he yep. he put a lot of work into that, mm. which was um, <clears throat> yeah, which was cool. Awesome. And, and could I ask, Karen? In line with the work that you do now in terms of helping corporations and people in general, I love that aspect about what you spoke about. It's part mm. of that why and your driver to Brian's question earlier is about helping people, being able to have a positive impact, understanding that you can positively impact people. Could you, Would you mind sharing with us, and I'll, I'll probably just try to narrow it down because you've already sort of alluded to this as well with your school teachers yeah. who took that extra time with other coaches and stuff. But just from the All Blacks perspective, would you mind sharing with us maybe one or two things from each of your leaders, like particularly the, the Steve Hansons or even uh, Graham Henry, Sir Graham Henry and and um, Wayne Smith and those sorts of people, or the, the makeup of mm-hmm. your leadership. Apologies for missing out people. I'm trying to think quick on my feet here. Yeah. But in, maybe one or two things that stands out from you that, they, that you really gleaned yeah. from them that helped shape you and, the, and things that you potentially look to utilize as part of what you're able to pass on in terms of paying it forward and the work that you do mm, now. Yeah, like I am, um, like those mm. three coaches you mentioned that, you know, they're epic coaches, um, but mm. they're all different. They are, you know, so yeah. that's the thing that probably sticks out in my mind as a, you know, as a, any leader, um, be yourself, you know, um, don't try to be someone you're not. Um, so that's what I talk about a lot, you know, it's like, you know, no point trying to be someone else, nice. you know, so um, yeah. you can lead in your own way. Um, and so if I look at, you know, Steve Hansen, he had a big impact on my career as an assistant coach, then coach my entire time I was there. Um, for me, um, mm. his intuitiveness, I think, um, mm. as a leader um, and knowing when to, um, you know, maybe change tact or knowing when to do something that's slightly different, I, I feel is, um, is a very valuable trait to have. Mm you know, as a leader, don't be closed off, you know, yeah. to your own ways. Um, <clears throat> I learned that, you know, definitely off him. I also learned around um, vulnerability as well. Um, you know, it's, it's so important, um, you know, in terms of creating a culture and creating people that are willing to work for you. It's, it's caring, eh? so that's basically it. Um, you know, as a as a coach, he cared about his people and, and he really showed that and I think that's, where everyone wanted to, to play well um, for him. Um, like Wayne Smith, he's a <clears throat> he is so he's so technically minded, um, but somehow through all this kind of technical jargon, he can relate to every player. So he could always relate to awesome. everyone and and give some a piece of gold to to you as a, as a player. Um, and that was just purely like he might just walk wander up past you at training and give you a little heads up about something or in the corridor or say, oh, look, come here and let's have a look at some clips or whatever. Um, and it was, yeah, so how he connected to get his knowledge across, I think, was um, as a leadership perspective um, yeah. is, is, is amazing. Um, and Ted, it's like Ted was, when I came <laughs> in as a head coach, like he's a little bit scared of him, you know, because like, he's, <laughs> he looks grumpy. He looks grumpy. He, he, he looks good. He's, um, yeah. <laughs> like, he's master type of, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll tell you this. So in 2009, um, we lost four tests. So we lost against French and we lost against the Springboks three times. 2009, like two years out from the World Cup. And it's like, yeah. and everyone's, you know, saying all this, you know, what they're saying in the media. Yeah. Um, and so Ted and that they switched the entire coaches around. So he ended up coaching forwards. I think Steve Hansen went to coach the backs and Wayne Smith went to coach uh, defense, I think. Um, 
and they so they're doing completely different roles for our end of year tour, and so, and then I just so this is my second year in the team, and they've given me the lineouts mm. to do the lineouts <laughs> as a flanker, so not even a lock, yeah. trying to do all that lineup, <laughs> which I hadn't even really done for the Crusaders, but I'd seen something in me in terms of you know. In terms of doing it, so I literally I yeah. called the lineouts through my entire career. But so Grant Henry, as a coach and the experience he had, he said mm. to me, "I trust you, and I will back you in what you want to do here." And so I would go in and would come up with what are we doing, and and it kind of created the basis of basically the All Black lineup for twelve years or whatever it was. So um, oh, yeah. and just you know, so that's just it's just little things, eh? Like, but all those moments that coaches, the impact that you have as a leader or a coach mm. on that person is huge, every interaction. Eh? So it's just remembering that, I think, as, as a leader. Um, it could be very small for them or for yourself, but for your people, um, you know, it has a massive impact. And I think that's what also happens, like, for me outside the game. Like, if I'm, <clears throat> you know, walking around town or something and someone comes up and says, g'day and blah, blah, blah. Oh, do you remember <laughs> 10 years ago when we met at bloody Facebook? Dude. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> that's that one interaction yeah. they have yeah. is massive. Yeah. Life, you know? Yeah. But, for, you know, for my stuff, it's, I can't, you know, you don't remember that interaction with yeah. this person, you know? But, um, hmm. but realizing that, so I, I kind of realizing that for me is a, you know, it kind of cha- it changed mm. your perspective on how you definitely interact with people out and about and, um, and that and I was, I was always felt like I was kind anyway and that stuff but yeah it, it certainly yeah. reminds mm. you of you know the impact you can have no, no. Mm. Actually, actually that's a good point sorry Brian I just, I'll jump in for one more that, that's a good point because I, I would imagine it's hard you mentioned the, not only the World Cup in New Zealand and having been surrounded so many people out and about but I see on clips and stuff, you guys have a, such a warm reception, no matter where you go. Usually, there's usually either New Zealanders <clears throat> there or there's some sort of reception. But I'd imagine that it must be hard at times. You've got people that want to get a photo with you or want to get your autograph or have that time, <laughs> have that moment, and yep. then they can bring it up 10 years later. Hey, you know, <laughs> will you just flick me off and just carry it on to the bus? No. But um, <clears throat> those, it must be hard sometimes, I'd imagine. Do, do you guys, is that something that, comes up or do is there some sort of I guess is there a briefing that yeah. happens you know because you can't always stop to spend that time with people even though you probably want to yeah look it's a it's on a personal level like it, mm. it is mm. it's it's it is slightly difficult I guess you know when you're in yeah. the when you're in the mix you know like man my first few years at Crusaders like if we lost like, <laughs> I wouldn't want to go out the next day you know like true yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know because you're young and you're mm. like oh everyone's gonna be looking at you you yeah, know? Um, but then you kind of get over that part of it a little bit because you yeah. realise how much people just care, you know. Like, yeah. Um, but then when I had a family and you know you're public property, aren't you? You know, you're on the TV, mm. you're, you know, you're captain in your your country and stuff, and you know, so you go with your family and you know if people are stopping you for photos, yep, I'm going to do it. Um, but there's also a point of me that really we just had to pick and choose, you know, like I just, yeah, I stop, you know, you stop going to the mall or you stop <laughs> going to the busy playgrounds with the kids, you, yeah. know, like just, you know, to try and, so you have to change a little bit. Um, yeah. Because I didn't mind doing the photos and signing the autographs and doing that stuff. That was fine, but it was more the case of um, mm. you're putting out your, your family a little bit for that. Yeah. Yeah. But 100%. in the, in the all blacks, like, you know, we do a lot of work around it. And so it was more around the case of you're an all black. And so we talk about this being all black 24 seven, you know, it's mm. um, probably similar, you know, you probably feel that, eh, Joe? Like um, mm. you are an all black. So no matter from now on, you're an all black. And so if you do something, it's, you taint the all blacks a little bit. Um, yeah. So now, you know, there'll be, mm. if, whatever happens, there'll be former all black, you know, <laughs> does yeah. this, if there's something that comes up and, you know, someone does something wrong or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's just understanding that, I guess. Um, mm. And there's no mm. pressure on it, but it's just going, okay, who you represent. I like that. And, and, um, mm. so and it's that, that sure. understanding of where you stand and, you know, who you represent. And uh, and I'm also mindful that you've done 
the, the, what we just talked about, you've done the same thing with agreeing to come onto this podcast and be able to share some of these insights with us and not just us, not just me and Joe, but for, for everyone, they'll be listening yeah. to this and hopefully they're taking away some really good um, thoughts. So if it's okay, I, want, I just want to dive into your captaincy a little bit and that leadership and that, that real public forming of, of um, becoming uh, a more prominent leader because now you have a title to go with your leadership space in, in the team. But you've you've taken over the mantle as all black captain after Richie, uh, and and he, he's he's I guess he's he's he set this bar or the standard, or he's been taken to a point where, and, and he probably feels a little bit uncomfortable about it, where you know he's um, die fired as, as like you know the the captain, and then you step into to the captaincy and you become the captain. Mm. But how did you? How did you nav- navigate that as a leader? Because first-time leaders, first-time people that are working in the space with with people are going to find that navigation. They need to find their space. How did you navigate that? And how did you make that space your own? Because you did. You know, we saw that happen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like I, I think like, I was pretty lucky. I, I think prior to being named the official <clears throat> captain, you know, like I'd led the side, you know, about mm, 10 yeah. times or so um, in Richie's absence. Um, and that gives you a little bit of an indication, not really, but I'd kind of been able to do my own framework. And, you know, under Richie, I was, you know, I was basically leading without, mm. you know, leading yeah. inside him, like trying to do my best to help yeah. him out. And yeah. so you're doing your bit. Um, and then obviously when you become the leader you have to you step up a bit more um, <laughs> I will say this though it is different from filling in as captain for your backs and yeah. being the <laughs> official leader so I realised how much it, it takes out of you mm. I realised how much it took out of Richie you know like uh, being your back captain is, is pretty intense and it's pretty full on um, and um, so really my mindset with that mm. was you know, to be who I was, you know, like I was, I'm different to Richie and, and, yeah. and how I lead a little bit, like I'm, I'm similar in some ways, but I'm different. I'm a different person. You know, it's just how we are, how we were brought up and all this stuff, you know, like, so, um, mm. you know, my strengths are connecting, it's connecting everyone, you know, across the board, Maori, Polynesian, you know, white, whatever, mm. wherever you're from. Um, so, um, yeah, just tapping into that and just tapping into being, you know, me, you know, like I think. Um, so I, 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 it's probably how I tried to lead. And I think um, it helped our team, um, you know, trying to do that. Um, but yeah, I, the guys mm. around me, you got you got to utilize them and you realize that, you know. So um, I think get a, a reasonably good group to help. Um, <laughs> And so we had a young group too, you know, so it was, uh, you know, it was an exciting mm. kind of moment for us, you know, in, in, that, in that period eh? to, to lead and, and be a part of shaping these guys because that's what a lot of it was, you know, everyone's learning when you've got uh, young people coming in, it's, you know, they don't necessarily know all the answers like mm. the previous kind of team had or the expectation was in that team. So, um, yeah, it was figuring out ways to... Um, help them gain the answers that they needed um, without, you know, just really just telling them what it was. So, um, yeah, that was how I tried to try to lead, I think. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds, sounds um, like obviously with all the influences that you've had, having the ability to glean and take from and use when you need to that, whether that be the intuitiveness from, from mm. Steve Hansen, whether it be that ability to relate and connect with everyone from Wayne Smith, and or to earn and have the trust and the respect, the the mana that you that you hold that you have from within your team, and being able to just share that in the ways that you have um, has been awesome. And I can only imagine that that's sort of some of the stuff that must happen in the work that you do. And I just wanted to ask here as well, Kieran. We haven't partly just due to the respect and privacy of your your family, and we haven't asked too much about <laughs> them. But how, when did you meet your sweetheart? Um, that you're with now um, and you don't need to go into all the details because we're mindful in that of, of yeah. those things but obviously family mm. seems to really shine through in terms of the time in the All Blacks and how important family is 
and obviously it is to you because yeah. when you ask that question, call one, mm. where or who are you? You were immediately the dad and the husband first. Yeah. So, yeah. how did you meet your sweetheart? And and just sort yeah. of a, can you share with okay. us as yeah, much yeah. as you can about your family? Oh, yeah, nice. cool. It's um, well, it's actually it's twenty years this week actually. <laughs> wow, um, twenty years, awesome. Um, we met at a bonfire um wow. party. Yeah, at school, <laughs> at high school at Rosal. So we both met oh. at Rosal College. Um, and uh yeah so we've been we're married now for since 2009 <laughs> <clears throat> so 13 years now so, Man, um awesome 14 years so uh yeah so and like we met in high school um yeah real story and then, i guess we went who asked who things. out hey who asked who out who asked who out? <laughs> yeah, well i don't know it's awkward eh, high school <laughs> Yeah. She's been stalking me for a while, so yeah, was... yeah. <laughs> she sent a friend. She's got one of her friends to go ask one of your friends to yeah, ask yeah. you if you want to go out with her. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like on Monday. Oh, yeah. oh you're going out now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then yeah, and then I guess a couple of years or so later, when we embarked to come down to Christchurch together, so that was kind of you know I was like, okay, are we doing this? And I was like, yep. Uh, so we packed up the car and um she'd never been to the south island um wow and there we go we we drive down and kind of start our, our new life and yeah awesome. it's, it's been amazing kind of since and and having someone like that she's really kind of that person to to ground me and um nice and you know understand kind of where i've where i've come from and, and things wow, like that so nice. and then yeah have, have three uh beautiful kids so mm. um Al, who's 11, Eden, who's nine, and Ruben, who's five. So, um, yeah, it's, awesome. uh, it's busy <laughs> and it's awesome. So, yeah, little fellas just started oh. school. And, um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> We're good. Thanks for that, Karen. That's great to hear. High school sweethearts and coming up to 20 years together, 13, 14 years marriage, three beautiful children. That's you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of power in that. Just listening mm. to you speak and seeing your face light up as you speak. That's so about cool. Isn't it? I love that too really because it, it, like especially when you, you you talked about it, you know, she she grounds you, and that that must be the most one of the most important things you can have, particularly when you like you said your public property, you know, you're 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 an all black, so the expectations mm. are, are massive and True. and all those sort of things. But having that grounding and that influence, I mean, you're from. The small time we spent together, you've already got it. That, that's from what I hear. But to be able to have somebody that can support you in that way is just amazing. I've got, a, a, I guess, a, a few more things just to just to probe a little bit, mm. um, if this is okay. Um, we've talked about some really ex, uh, interesting times in your career as an All Black. But out of all the games that you've played, um, or all the situations you've been in, what do you think is, has been the most challenging <clears throat> time what did you learn from that? Mm. Mm. Um, oh, look, I'm not. Mm. Like we had some, you know, been very fortunate that mm. it's been pretty successful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, probably uh, for me, it's 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 mm. away from it a little bit, away from yep. the actual game. It's yep. probably the injuries and, and stuff that I've dealt with, mm. um, that have been the most challenging. And, and for, it's probably like I had a bit of trouble with concussion one year, um, yep. two thousand and fourteen, um, and it's just kind of it's a little bit like I speak to people now like with COVID, you know, and it's like, and a little bit of this kind of long COVID where it just lingers and yep. you kind of. And then suddenly you've got to, you wake up and you're a little bit fatigued mm. and go, oh, is this, you know, am I still got symptoms or am I still got, and it just kind of, it's constantly in your head. Um, and that's kind of what I went through for, you know, a good two or three months um, where I had kind of doubts and I had all these things going on. Um, and you just, yeah, it was mm. a really tough time. It was really tough on my, on my wife, 100%. Um, mm. And we did, we navigated our way through it. Um, like and I sought the right help and actually, you know saw you know um, psychologist and um, and then got some tests done and it ended up being I was out of whack my balance was out of whack so my vestibular system yep. wasn't necessarily my brain it was my my balance um, so it was kind of like this thing that happens like after a car crash 
So I went and saw these, these balance specialists and doing all these weird kind of eye tests and yep. things to try and I'm feeling really, really bad. You know, like I couldn't, couldn't drive without getting a headache, you know, and stuff. Right. And, um, so you kind of, in a, yeah, I think that's that's tough because you're kind of going through this thing where you're wondering where it's when it's going to end, and you're wondering, um, you know, if this is it a little bit, mm. um, and yeah, mm. and just second guessing every little symptom or something that's happening, um, and so. <clears throat> that was hard and it was hard kind of because I did like my wife knew and like I was actually still playing a bit during this time for the Crusaders yeah and um and feeling like pretty crap um and not really telling the boys <laughs> mm. so that was hard because I was captain <laughs> captain in the team yeah. Richie was out at the time and well I was captain in the team because it's um and so you know I didn't want to show that it wasn't, wasn't and so you know, it was a, it was a difficult time, um, and I think mm. just being able to, if I'd had my time again, I'd certainly be share. I'd share it with a few more people, mm. um, just to get the understanding with it, um, and I wouldn't, mm. um, I wouldn't be anxious about being anxious. I think if I if I had my time again, like I was happy to yeah. be anxious, yeah, but I was an- I was anxious because I was anxious. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, like. So, um, <laughs> don't don't feel like being anxious is, is a wrong. Yeah, I think that's yeah, fine. Yeah, so, that's, uh, that's what I'm it. trying to say. Um, and yeah, so that was that was probably one. Of, that's probably one of the most difficult times I think I've uh, had around the game. Um, and you know, fortunately, it's it's it came good. And um, you know, for the rest of my career, it was it was, it was pretty mm, fine. Oh, and now, so um, yeah. let's hope it continues that way. Yeah, absolutely. So, Long and what what your what that stuff, Karen? Not only the injuries and that particular piece. Thank you for sharing that. But mm. I wanted to ask as well. This I might be jumping ahead a bit, Brian. Sorry if I am, but and Karen. But also, you mentioned earlier at the start. You know, thirty five, thirty six years young. This term retiring from you know professional sport. But did that? What sort of things? It would be great to hear from you. Were there things that you were already working on? Did you already have in your mind? Were you already looking ahead? I'm assuming part of the leadership and management that probably maybe there's some support and stuff around that for you guys to help with the transition. Were you already looking <coughs> towards doing what you're doing now in terms of continuing to positively impact and help mm. other people before you got out? Um, I didn't know how it was going to look. Yep. But yeah, I, probably in the last few years, I was, I was starting to think about that and I was right. connecting with a few different people. Yep. Um, about things, um, and then when I was in Japan, like I had a bit of time in Japan by myself, um, to play up there, yep. um, in the last couple of years, and I did some studies. So I did a, um, I've studied towards nice. coaching, a sports coaching degree, which I'm like okay. a paper or so on finishing. Awesome. Um, <laughs> basically, that took me ten years, but I still haven't done it. And then I, um, in Japan, like um. Yeah, I did a Bachelor of uh, Applied Management and kind of like looked at wow. all my learnings over my career and, um, and leadership and all this stuff and, yep. and put all that together. So um, kind of solidified a little bit of what I wanted to do. Um, and then, yeah, since coming back, I've, just, I've like I'm not just saying that I'm open to, to anything and just to talking to people and, yeah, seeing where it ends up for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and yeah, and fortunate to be in a position where I can do that a little bit and yeah. do this and do that or not do that, go watch mm. the kids sport today or, you know, Beautiful. maybe go play golf this day or whatever it is, you know, like, yeah. um, that's, that's where I'm at a little bit. So I know cool. I'm enjoying that side of, side of the life cause, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's the time, the family's the priority and then, yeah. um, yeah, definitely this stuff here. It's um, it's exciting actually. Some of the opportunities I've started with, and it's it's hopefully going to you know keep growing. So yeah, it's good. long that continue and grow for you with the work that you do. And and with with that, I love. Um, so you spoke about, or when you've been speaking about the connection, do you still when you mentioned golf, who do you get out on the golf course with it, to to hit around? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, I I don't get out enough. Right. I should get out more. But Izzy Dag, Izzy Dag, so yeah. Izzy, right? yeah. 
but he's like he's a he's a gun he? golfer. He's still, wow. yeah. yeah, So he's like yeah, he's low for low handicap. <laughs> now. So yeah, we're at the same club, the same golf club. So nice. we've got to get out a bit more together, um, but hard to get out at the same time at, at the moment. Yeah. But um, yeah, I I need to. I'd, Going to get back into it because yeah. I um I enjoy it and played a lot in, in Japan, but sure um, does. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a good game because it tests you. Yeah, it? <laughs> definitely. It, how how did you find living? How did your wife and yourself and the family find living in Japan? What was that like for you guys? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so it was unfortunate. Like we were there just before COVID, yeah. um, oh. and so we only had probably you know two or three months together. Yeah, um, right. And then you know school got closed up there and stuff. Yeah. And, so um, we didn't quite get the chance to really experience yeah. it. Like it was pretty cool. Like we got to go skiing and, and stuff and enjoy the snow. And um, I, I, I enjoy the place. Japan's amazing. Yeah. Um, but I was just, unfortunate. I was just there over that whole kind of uh, being in kind of bubbles yeah, and, yeah. Mm. Um, and couldn't quite appreciate you know the, the beauty that it has. Oh, you nice. know? So um, gotcha. beautiful. Yeah, uh, hopefully I, I get think... back there one day. <laughs> what we've heard is just gold throughout this last wee while and it's gone fast so we really again really appreciate your time i've just got i guess one more question before we then look to, to wrap up if that's okay and it's really just from your perspective you've, you've learned and you've shared this with us you've learned so much in terms of your leadership and how you relate to people and connect and i, I love that whole connecting with people and, and helping others but for you karen what do you see as a difference between a good leader and a great leader Um, I think it's it's their approach. I think it's whether their their approach is, um, you know, focused on outcomes or mm. um, metrics or what have you, or if it's focused on people. Um, mm. you know, I feel the great ones are focused on the people, and it's getting that right. Um, okay. And if you if you get that right, then you know you, all this other stuff will, will just will come out of it. So um, love that. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Uh, my mentor, awesome. I think, Thank you so much for sharing that. I just want to, um, I guess, just turn the time over for um, just to, <laughs> to wrap us up. And, and Joe, what, if you have um, thoughts that you'd like to share or questions. Yeah. I, I do. I've got probably, uh, Kieran, is there anything we forgot to ask you at the start? Sorry, we, we usually do. But is there anything mm. that you wanted to uh, that you might like mm. to speak about or take some time to highlight that you want to draw attention to anything that's that that's important to you that um sorry that's why we usually ask it at the start before yeah no sweet no i think um no i'm happy man yeah. like you guys yeah that was, that was good that was a good chat and um oh, yeah enjoyed it and it's, it's cool because it's slightly different <laughs> you know it's, it's good wow. you know i can tell a few different stories and things so Okay. Um, that was nice. Thank you very much, Kieran. Well, well from my side, mm. I just want to, you know, really acknowledge you and thank you, bro, from both Brian and I, on behalf of myself in particular, for not only the example that you've been and the great leader that you've been for us in Aotearoa and the All Blacks in particular, but you've inspired so many people. You continue to inspire us old fellas even now. Just, just listening and seeing mm. the way that you've played the game, the way that you continue to live now. <clears throat> And the things that you're doing for in the service of trying to help other people by sharing some of your experiences, um, your lived experiences, and being able to connect and, and pass that on is a powerful thing. And so thank you very much for spending some time with us. I'd love it if at some point mm. down the line, I definitely, because <laughs> I've got a whole bunch more questions, but bloody Brian's got to go to work. So I, it would it would be great if at some point we could coax you into coming back on to, to go off and to delve into a few more other things. But Mate, much respect to you and everything that you've done for Aotearoa, for the sport of rugby and what you continue to do and the work that you're doing, obviously, with the companies that you work on. But most importantly, as you mentioned, your role as a husband and a father. So long may your success and growth continue, Kieran. And thank yeah. you very much for being here with us today. Thank mate. you. And Kieran, well. any final really thoughts you'd like to share? No, thanks, guys. It's been, it's been brilliant. And, um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Love that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll tell absolutely. all you've heard um, it here. You've heard Kieran Reed, all black captain, but more importantly, dad and husband. Um, you've heard about connections. You've heard about leadership. You've heard about um, the, his journey and captaincy and how uh, all these things tie together. But I think you also heard some real nuggets and gold. And I hope we take time as we listen through this that we might be able to 
pull these things out and apply it to our own situation, mm. our own place. So uh, without further ado, thank you once again, Karen, for spending this valuable time, your valuable time with us, with Aotearoa. And without further ado, let's go. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, would you mind doing us a favour and letting us know via the comments in our YouTube channel or by emailing us at either joe at epicpodcast.co.nz or brian at epicpodcast.co.nz That's E-P-I-C-H podcast.co.nz We'd really love to hear from you so that we can continue to strive to deliver content worthy of your time. If you'd like to support us further, we invite you to consider liking and subscribing to us and hitting that notification bell on YouTube so that you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes as they drop. We also invite you to consider following us on Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. Just type in Epic Aotearoa. That's A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. Regardless of your decision, we appreciate your time once again and wish you every success as you continue to work towards creating a better future. Let's go.